Hi there, this is George from Golden Game Soccer. Today we're looking at the legendary player and coach Johan Cruyff, the most total of footballers. On the point of total football, it's worth mentioning at this point that we've previously done a mini documentary on Renus Michels where we discuss total football. However, we'll be touching on total football from the perspective of Johan Cruyff, or as he was also known, the golden tulip, the skinny one, El Salvador, the saviour, and the magician. Cruyff the player was seen as a natural successor as the world's greatest player following Pelé, a player with wonderful balance, speed and excellent technical skill. As a manager, he was a visionary. Perhaps his greatest attribute was his tactical awareness and his ability to understand and utilise space. His outspoken nature resulted in him creating much positive change, but also rubbing some people up the wrong way. At times he was perceived by some as arrogant and egotistical, but there is no doubting. He was the star of his generation and a true icon for the Dutch and for football as a whole. Johannes Johan Cruyff was born on the 25th of April 1947 in Amsterdam, on a street five minutes away from Ajax Stadium. Cruyff had been a heavy smoker from an early age. He underwent an emergency bypass operation in 1991 and suffered more heart trouble in 1997. In October 2015 he was diagnosed with lung cancer. Cruyff died at the age of 68 in a clinic in Barcelona, surrounded by his wife, children and grandchildren on the 24th of March 2016. Johan was the second son and came from a humble and working class background. His parents owned a greengrocers. He was encouraged to play by his football loving father. He played football with his schoolmates and older brother Henny whenever he could and idolised the prolific Dutch dribbler Fuss Wilkes. Fuss Wilkes was nicknamed the Mona Lisa of Rotterdam, an elegant striker and a phenomenal dribbler. Cruyff would practice in the neighbourhood playground and it is here that Ajax youth coach Janny van der Veen noticed Cruyff's talent. He instantly decided to offer him a place at the Ajax training academy. Cruyff joined the Ajax youth system on his 10th birthday. In 1959, when Cruyff was 12 years old, his father died from a heart attack at 45. His mother had to close the greengrocers and took up a job with Ajax Football Club. Cruyff viewed a potential football career as a way of paying tribute to his father. These early childhood experiences significantly impacted the young Cruyff and led to his later desire to always seek financial security. Cruyff was 5 foot 10 or 178 centimetres and mainly played as a striker but his interpretation of the position would probably be best understood these days as a false nine. A decoy centre forward who drops and drifts finding spaces in deeper areas and creating space for other players to move into. He made his first team debut on the 15th of November 1964 in the Dutch league against the team later to be known as Groningen scoring the only goal for Ajax in a 3-1 defeat. That season Ajax finished 13th. The English coach Vic Buckingham had been sacked halfway through the season with the visionary coach Renus Michels taking over as manager. Cruyff really started to make an impression in the 1965-66 season and established himself as a regular first team player. In total that season Cruyff scored 25 goals in 23 games and Ajax won the league championship. This was also the year that Cruyff became fully professional. Renus Michels had worked hard to convince the Ajax board to guarantee the players wages. Before this all the players had other jobs, with Cruyff himself also working at a printing factory in order to make ends meet. Professional recognition was also of particular importance to Cruyff. He realised that he could make money playing football, but also that his career could end at any time. He knew that he had a talent that people were paying to see. At the beginning of the 1970-71 season, Cruyff suffered a groin injury. He made his comeback on the 30th of October 1970 against PSV Eindhoven, and rather than wear his usual number 9, which was in use by Jerry Muren, he instead used number 14. It was very uncommon in those days for the starters of a game not to play with numbers 1 to 11, but from that moment onwards Cruyff wore number 14, even with the Dutch national team. 
This was an example of his rebellious side, but showed his understanding of his status and foresight regarding his marketing potential. He also refused to play in the Adidas boots that the FA demanded, as they had signed a contract with Adidas. Instead, he played in Puma. During the 1974 World Cup, he even wore a shirt with only two stripes across the shoulders instead of Adidas's trademark three. He had become an idol to a generation of young people. He was a fantastic player, but was regularly displaying a rebellious side to his personality, which appealed to the Dutch youth. He questioned the current establishment and order of things, and in this way, represented them. During his nine seasons at the club, Cruyff led Ajax to six Dutch league titles, four Dutch Cups and three successive European Cups, in the second of which, against Inter Milan, Cruyff scored two goals. In his time at Ajax overall, Cruyff played 240 games and scored 190 goals. In recognition for his achievements at Ajax, he was twice awarded the European Footballer of the Year Award in 1971 and 1973. On the 19th of August 1973, he played his last match for Ajax where they were defeated by FC Amsterdam 6-1. Cruyff's role in total football and Ajax's style of play in general was extremely significant. Fundamentally, total football developed as an offensive tactic to combat teams that defended very deep and with numbers or used man-marking strategies. Total football involved playing with fluidity and with the players showing versatility, switching positions as required. Everything revolved around the players' appreciation of space. The pitch, a fixed space, became flexible. Angles and distances were vital. Opponents could be beaten with intelligence and the understanding of space rather than power. With Renus Michels as manager of Ajax, Cruyff became a massive influence on the pitch. Michels was responsible for putting together and managing the players. Equal credit, however, must also be given to the genius of Cruyff who contributed to the on-field organisation. Cruyff himself discussed how Michels could arrange the outside of the field, whereas he would arrange the inside of the field. He made an impact from a very early age. Even as a teenager, Cruyff was the manager on the pitch, pointing and educating the rest of the squad about where and where not to run. He saw the changing picture in the game. He had the ultimate awareness of the relationships between each individual's movements in both offensive and defensive contexts. He began to coach the players about precisely where to stand, about their body shape when receiving the ball, in order to create the widest field of vision and perfect angle to pass. To create space when attacking, it was necessary to make the pitch as wide and as long as possible, to be unpredictable and disrupt the opposition's organisation in order to create spaces in an engineered way. When defending, the opposite was required. To reduce space required the team to be compact and narrow. The arrangement of the team forced the opposition into playing in congested spaces with less time in order to force errors and to win possession. In 1971, after the first of the European Cup triumphs, Renus Michels left to join Barcelona. Michels' successor, Stefan Kovac, then oversaw a wonderful period of Ajax dominance, leading Ajax to two European Cup wins in the 1971-72 season and the 1972-73 season. Kovac's management style gave the senior players lots of freedom, with Cruyff enjoying an increase in his authority and influence. Cruyff was comfortable with this and believed that the players were ready to manage themselves with minimal interference. Kovac left following his successes and a new coach, George Knobo, was appointed for the start of the 1973-74 season, Knobo decided to have a vote to nominate the season's captain. It is understood that some of the newer and less famous Ajax players had been getting resentful over Cruyff's status in the club. There was some jealousy about the publicity he received and the influence he exerted. No doubt his superior earnings would also have caused some discontent. 
Following the vote, Piet Kaiser was made captain. Cruyff is said to have been furious. He was upset with the new manager for not making him captain automatically and at the players who he thought were being disrespectful by not voting for him. He made it his priority to leave Ajax with the utmost urgency. In mid-1973, Cruyff joined his former coach and mentor, Rinus Michels, at Barcelona for six million guilders, around one million pounds, in a world record transfer fee. He left Ajax even though he was ineligible to play competitive fixtures for Barcelona until the end of the year. He arrived at Barcelona with the club sitting at the bottom of the Spanish league. By the end of his first season, Barcelona had finished as champions for the first time since 1960, including a 5-0 humiliation of arch-rivals Real Madrid away at the Bernabeu. In 1974, Cruyff was again crowned European Footballer of the Year. He never repeated the league triumph and only got as far as the semi-final in the European Cup in 1975, when Barcelona lost to Leeds. In 1978, Barcelona defeated Las Palmas 3-1 to win the Copa del Rey and Cruyff left Barcelona at the end of the season. As a Dutch international, Cruyff played 48 matches and scored 33 goals. He made his official debut on the 7th of September 1966 in the Euro 1968 qualifier against Hungary, scoring in a 2-2 draw. In his second match, a friendly against Czechoslovakia, Cruyff was the first Dutch international to receive a red card. The Dutch FA banned him from Ajax games, but not internationals. Prior to the 1974 World Cup, Holland had never made any telling impact in international competition. They did qualify for the 1934 and 38 World Cups in Italy and France. However, in the decade preceding the 1974 World Cup, Holland had produced an outstanding generation of players that had dominated football in Europe. Cruyff had come back from Barcelona to participate. The Dutch national team had come a long way on the international scene. Michels was coach and they looked capable of winning the upcoming 1974 World Cup in West Germany. It was also the first and only time that Cruyff was to appear in a World Cup final tournament. Michels planned to replicate the system with most of the players he had developed at Ajax. Cruyff's leadership on and off the pitch was going to be vital and he was influential in terms of playing style and team selection. Holland's first game of the 1974 World Cup was against Uruguay. They lined up in their famous bright orange shirts and played well, winning 2-0, but really they should have won by more. Holland's next game was against Sweden. It was a poor game and Holland drew 0-0. The Sweden game is more remembered for one moment of wonderful skill from Cruyff. He was facing Sweden's right-back Jan Olsen. Cruyff disguised the turn by shaping up to cross the ball, using the inside of his foot to cut the ball behind his standing foot. The iconic Cruyff turn would go on to be a skill that everyone has heard of and a fundamental technique that all youngsters learn. Against Bulgaria in the next game, Holland got back to their best, winning 4-1 and moving on to face Argentina who they also beat 4-0 with Cruyff scoring the first and last goals. The Dutch beat East Germany 2-0 in their next game and went on to face Brazil in the semi-finals. This Brazil side was not the same quality as it had been in the 1970 World Cup. Pelé was in attendance, but only watched from the crowd. Holland outplayed and outfought Brazil in a really violent match, but won 2-0. Cruyff scored the second goal, finishing right-footed on the volley from across into the box. They reached the final after five wins and one draw, with 14 goals scored and only one conceded in six matches. Holland would face West Germany in the final in Munich's Olympic Stadium. It would be the match that would come to define Dutch football. Germany's Franz Beckenbauer versus Holland's Johan Cruyff. 30 votes was chosen to man Mark Cruyff. 
Holland went ahead early in the game, winning and scoring a penalty without West Germany even touching the ball. Cruyff kicked off and the ball was passed around the Dutch team 15 times before returning to Cruyff, who then went on a run past Bertie Votes and ended when he was fouled by Uli Honus inside the box. Teammate Johan Nieskin scored from the penalty spot to give the Netherlands a 1-0 lead and the Germans had not even touched the ball. Holland dominated for the next 20 to 30 minutes before Votes began to get a grip of Cruyff. Tactically, Cruyff played in a deeper position than usual and he became less and less of a factor as the game went on. West Germany's confidence grew and they equalised, also through a penalty. After this, Holland passed the ball around, retaining possession but largely going nowhere and most importantly, failing to score. In the 43rd minute, Germany scored their second goal through Gerd Müller. In the second half, the Dutch played well and had chances but simply could not score. During the latter half of the final, Cruyff's influence was stifled by the effective marking of Votes, Franz Beckenbauer, Uli Hoeneß and Wolfgang Overath, who all dominated the midfield as West Germany came back to win 2-1. 90 minutes of thrilling football ended and Holland had lost. Despite this, Cruyff was still awarded the golden ball for his performance in the finals. The Dutch nation celebrated for getting so far in the tournament. However, deep down the supporters and players were devastated that they had lost. Hard though it was for the Dutch to overcome, they had made a major statement. Although Cruyff's beautiful total football team had lost the 1974 final to the Germans, they had played football the world still talks about. Cruyff retired from international football in October 1977, having helped the national team qualify for the upcoming World Cup in 1978 in Argentina. Without him, the Netherlands finished runners-up in the World Cup again, losing to the hosts 3-1. Cruyff nearly retired from football entirely in 1978, but after losing most of his money in a series of poor investments, including investing in a pig farm, he decided to return to football and play in the United States. At the age of 32, Cruyff signed a lucrative deal with the Los Angeles Aztecs of the North American Soccer League for the 1978-79 season. He stayed at the Aztecs for one year and was voted NASL Player of the Year. The following season, he moved to play for the Washington Diplomats. In March 1981, Cruyff returned to Europe to play for Levante in Spain. Injuries and disagreements with the club administrators meant that he only made 10 appearances, but scored two goals. Cruyff then returned to play in his homeland, rejoining Ajax on the 30th of November 1980. Ajax were 8th in the table at the time, after 13 games. After 34 games, however, Ajax finished the 1980-81 season in second. In the following two seasons, Ajax became league champions and won the Dutch Cup in 1982-83. Whilst playing for Ajax in 1982, Cruyff scored a famous goal from a penalty. Instead of shooting at goal, Cruyff nudged the ball sideways to teammate Jesper Olsen, who in return passed it back to Cruyff to tap the ball into the empty net. At the end of the 1982-83 season, Ajax decided not to offer Cruyff a new contract. Cruyff responded by signing for Ajax's arch-rivals, Feyenoord. Feyenoord had won a Dutch League Championship for 10 years. Cruyff's first season at Feyenoord was a successful one in which the club won the League and Dutch Cup. Despite his age, Cruyff played all but one of the league matches that season. He was voted as Dutch Footballer of the Year for the fifth time and at the end of the season announced his final retirement. In the final years at Ajax and Feyenoord, Cruyff played with lots of up-and-coming Dutch players who would later go on to win the European Championship in 1988. Players who learnt from him included Marco van Basten, Ruud Hullip, Frank Rijkaard and Ronald Koeman. Cruyff's playing career had made a significant impact on the playing field and beyond. He was a moderniser. Cruyff had become an icon of the new Holland following the post-war period. He was a revolutionary and a symbol of the 60s for the Dutch people. He represented the progressive and forward-thinking modern Holland.
Cruyff's impact as a player was far-reaching. Unbelievably, as a manager, Cruyff was able to be equally inspirational. Just as he had revolutionised and transformed football as a player, he did the same as a manager and technical director. He was able to transform football clubs' identities and inspire teams and players to new levels of achievement. His approach was long-term and created a legacy that meant those clubs continued to achieve success, playing in a wonderful style, long after he left. In June 1985, Cruyff returned to Ajax again. It was during this period as manager that Cruyff was able to implement an experiment with his favoured playing style. Cruyff adapted Renus Michel's 4-3-3 formation and made it a more attacking 3-4-3. He incorporated three mobile defenders with a ball-playing goalkeeper, who came far out of his goal to support build-ups when the team was in possession. He used genuine right and left wingers, skillful players who provided width to stretch the pitch and offered a threat in behind the opposition defence with their pace. He prioritised having more players in midfield than the opposition in order to overload and be the dominant team on the pitch in central areas. His style demanded possession of the ball, risk-taking, Invention, attacking ideas and style, positivity and fearlessness, to play beautiful but winning football. Cruyff mentioned preferring to win 5-4 than 1-0. He said, simple play is also the most beautiful. The solution that seems the simplest is in fact the most difficult one. His system was one based on creative individualism. The team ethic was vital. In Cruyff's teams, there were clearly defined roles and responsibilities with some players carrying out a more simplistic but no less important job beautifully. The team defended and attacked together. However, the team was shaped around the most important and creative players. Cruyff also upgraded Ajax's training curriculum and scouting at youth level based on these principles. In the 1985-86 season, Ajax lost the league title to PSV, despite scoring 120 goals and only conceding 35. They won the Dutch Cup in that season, and the next. In 1987, he coached a young Ajax side to victory in the European Cup Winners' Cup, beating Lokomotiv Leipzig 1-0. Cruyff gained good managerial experience, and he was getting a reputation for developing a team with attacking flair whilst also bringing through young players like Marco van Basten and Dennis Bergkamp. After having appeared for the club as a player, Cruyff returned to Barcelona and was appointed manager on the 4th of May 1988. He was brought in to replace England's future manager Terry Venables. He walked into a club at war. The previous season the players had demanded the resignation of the club president Josep Luis Nunes. The club were demanding the players pay outstanding tax owed to the Spanish Treasury as a result of previous contractual issues. The president remained, and Cruyff's appointment appeased the fans and helped to calm the club. It is important to understand that Barcelona at the time were not perceived at the same level as the Barcelona we have come to know in recent history. They had only won the league once in 14 years. Only two years earlier they had been in the European Cup final, but performances had deteriorated and the club was on the slide. Fast forward eight years with Cruyff and Barcelona had won 11 trophies. As a player, he had saved the club on the pitch in the late 1970s. Ten years later, he was replicating this feat, but this time as a manager. Cruyff began this turnaround by bringing through a group of hungry young players who hadn't experienced or been part of Barcelona's unsettled history. He brought in players that allowed him to play the necessary style of football. Technical footballers such as Baquero, Goica Chair, Ronald Koeman, Michael Laudrup, Romario, Georgi Hadji and Christo Stoichkov. Pep Guardiola was also brought in from the academy. He had to redefine and manage an unstable relationship with the club's hands-on president. Cruyff had his new team playing his attractive style of football, with results also following. 
he was creating a new identity for Barcelona. In 1979, Cruyff wanted to establish a copy of the Ajax Youth Academy in Barcelona. He began to implement the same attacking style of play with the youth teams. He knew that to sustain and improve the brave Barcelona style, demanded players that had been trained from an early age to have the technical skill and mindset necessary to be able to make the transition into the senior squad. Cruyff knew that the Catalan people also liked having local players in the first team. He understood that the fans would be more patient with the young Catalan players. A production line was needed and Cruyff overhauled Barcelona's La Masia training academy. Prior to Cruyff, Barcelona selected players largely based on physique. Cruyff the player himself was not a physical specimen and had succeeded despite the system. His skills were vision and technique. La Masia was restructured to select players based on ability rather than height. Cruyff ensured that every team, from the under-8s to Barcelona's reserve squad Barca B, copied the first team's 3-4-3 formation and playing style. He had developed a curriculum that produced players ready for the Barcelona first team. He also had to develop a structure to support the coaches to deliver the philosophy and methodology to those players. Cruyff was also responsible for introducing rondos, possession games played in tight spaces. In a small area, the player's movement and decision-making had to be fast, demanding high levels of technique. The repetitive rehearsal of rondos produced the tic tac style that he transferred from Ajax and then improved on at Barca. La Masia began producing the intelligent and technical players he wanted. Famously, Messi, Xavi and Iniesta, but not to mention other such notable players as Fabregas, Piquet, Busquets, Puyol. The list is endless. Strengthening the squad in this way was one of the main reasons for Cruyff's huge success at Barcelona. Cruyff's legacy at Barcelona was more than just about trophies and records. He produced a defined Barcelona identity, a winning mentality and a football ideology that still exists today. On the 11th of July 2010, Spain won the World Cup final with eight players from Barcelona. Seven were from La Masia and six of them were in the starting lineup: Piquet, Puyol, Iniesta, Xavi, Busquets and Pedro. With Cruyff, Barcelona experienced a golden era. They won four La Liga titles in a row between 1991 and 1994. He led the club to four European finals, two European Cup Winners' Cup finals and two European Cup Champions League finals, winning one of each. He also won one Copa del Rey and four Supercopa de España. The Dutchman's last two seasons at the club were less successful and during that time, Barcelona failed to win a trophy of any kind. As a result of his very public disagreements with the club's president, Cruyff left the club in 1996. Cruyff was also the club's longest serving manager. He managed the first team for eight consecutive seasons between 1988 and 1996, with a total of 602 games. Johan Cruyff left Barcelona in 1996 and never took another big job. As a result of heart issues due to smoking, he didn't want to manage again. Though he vowed never to coach, he became an unofficial advisor for Barcelona president Joan Laporta. It was Cruyff who recommended the appointment of Frank Rijkaard in 2003. Again, Barcelona was successful winning back-to-back league titles and another Champions League in 2006. In the summer of 2008, Rijkaard left the club and even though Jose Mourinho was pushing for the job at Camp Nou, Cruyff chose Pep Guardiola. As a player, Cruyff is mentioned alongside Pele and Maradona. He helped to turn Ajax and the Dutch national team into football powerhouses in the 1970s. 
he is regarded as one of the few truly great players who was able to transition into being a great manager as well. His greatness was summed up by the former Dutch international Johan Nieschkens. If you look at the greatest players in history, most of them couldn't coach. If you look at the greatest coaches in history, most of them were not great players. Johan Cruyff did both, and in such an exhilarating style. Cruyff is undisputably regarded as one of the greatest and most influential managers in the history of the game. His legacy was not just about trophies and records, but also the style and the identity. Johan Cruyff created successful dynasties and is the guiding spirit of Dutch football. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make a comment, like, share and subscribe. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks again.